Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our weekly webinar series. Today, we are uh, having the 45th episode of our weekly series. Uh, we are continuing the topic that we started last time. Very, very important topic on what have been the recent judgments on the RDB Act and the Surfacey Act. And uh, uh, thanks again to all of you to join back. Over to Anil, sir. Thank you, Ankit. And namaste to all participants. Uh, in this 45th episode, we are continuing with part two of uh, Supreme Court judgments on Surfacey and RDB Act. In the last uh, episode on Saturday, 40, 44th episode, we discussed about various uh, uh, landmark judgments from Supreme Court and where it was held that the burden of proof for agriculture land is on the borrower, is on the pledger, mortgager, and it is not on the secured creditor. It is a, the borrower will have to show that the agriculture land is being used really for the agricultural purposes. The secondly, we also discussed that the pre-deposit of 50% as a prerequisite for filing an appeal before DRAT, that would be calculated inclusive of interest. So that was also a good uh, a final judgment from Supreme Court. Another judgment we discussed that this uh, MSME rights, the when this MSME felicitation council uh, ordered for attachment of property, and that property was earlier mortgaged and it was held by a high court that this MSME has overriding powers. And finally, the Supreme Court said that the surface has the overriding powers and the MSME uh, is not. So if, this, if the uh, surface is invoked and the secured asset uh, would not be uh, kind of tainted by any other kind of attachment or any other kind of uh, order from any other court. Also, uh, another uh, very, very landmark judgment with the, uh, when the DM declined to pass an order uh, because, of the, because of a right of a uh, bona fide tenant. And the Supreme Court said that the, it is not the jurisdiction of the DM to resolve the disputes. The jurisdiction for tenancy uh, lies with the DRAT, DRT, and not with the DM. So DM has to give an order, and then the aggrieved party would go to DRT, not to the DM. So these are the various uh, judgments that we handled. And in fact, I believe that the anyone who is practicing under surface definitely would have gained Similarly, we are again, we are continuing today with the next part of uh, the judgments, uh, depending upon the time, but today would be the last episode for the uh, Supreme Court judgments on surface or the RDB Act. There is no third part uh, for this. I'm sharing my screen, Ankit. So we, in fact, we could continue till uh, because this R.D. Jain and Company versus Capital First Trust, uh, this was uh, not discussed. So this is again a Supreme Court judgment in July 22. And this uh, judgment is regarding the, uh, it, in this case, the, the, the background of this case is that the, in the borrower, in fact, uh, invoked Surfacey Act and the, uh, the lender, the secured creditor invoked Surfacey Act and the borrower refused. And then an application was submitted to CMM court. And the said application was adjourned time and account and the order was not being passed. And the an early application, early uh, disposal application was filed and that was also dismissed by CMM <clears throat> saying that there are many old applications which are pending, so therefore, it is not possible to provide a kind of uh, priority to anyone. 
So the writ petition before the uh, High Court was also filed, and it was basically uh, decided in various. See, so the the kind of uh, <clears throat> High Court uh, also said that the CM is to dispose of the applications under Section 14 of the Sufficiency Act in time bound manner. The High Court also uh, provided an opinion that considering the volume of application, the surface, the pending pendency of the application, the CMM, who is an authority under Section 14 of the Surface Act, cannot decide such applications within a, 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 a time bound period in terms of the first and second proviso. The High Court further observed, observed and held that as the status of the learned CMM and the additional CMM is the same and identical. The additional CMM can exercise the powers under Section 14 of the Surface Act, and while interpreting Section 14 of the Surface Act, has held that DM or CMM is not a persona designata for the purposes of Section 14 of the Surface Act. The expression DM and the CMM, as appearing in Section 14 of the Surface Act, shall mean uh, shall deem to mean and include additional DM and additional CMM for the purposes of section 14 of the surface Act. However, <clears throat> the borrower, because the borrower wanted to uh, delay the process of uh, getting permission from the, or getting an order from the CMM, the borrower actually preferred this appeal to Honorable Supreme Court. And the petition was filed by the borrower as the borrower was claiming that this DM and the CMM as mentioned in section 14 of the Surface Act would not include additional DM and additional chief, uh, chief metropolitan. Therefore, the Supreme Court finally, uh, let's see what Supreme Court held. In fact, we will see what kind of uh, contentions were given by the borrowers and the uh, state. In this case, the borrowers said that there are many high courts. In fact, they have given the contrary view uh, and <clears throat> in fact, the, the decision was given by Gujarat High Court, Kerala High Court, and Kolkata High Court uh, uh, is, is uh, saying that this is, uh, uh, this is the powers given to the DMM and CMM and not to the other officials. These are the three judgments like Gujarat High Court, Kerala High Court, and Kolkata High Court. However, the Maharashtra, like the High Court of Bombay, in fact, gave a uh, favorable judgment and saying that these uh, uh, can be delegated. So DM and ADM are two different distinct authorities. This is what was contended by the borrower. The powers conferred on DM or CMM, as the case may be under Section 14, are inter alia that the powers are conferred specifically to these authorities. One of the aspects of the power to be exercised is that the DM or CMM has to satisfy himself about the compliance of the requirement of the satisfaction section. The satisfaction is personal satisfaction. They themselves only are competent authorities to exercise the power. The nature of powers under section 14 would not permit transfer or delegation of these powers. So because this was a very serious issue, which was in fact also impacting adversely to the implementation of surface law, Ankit. And the DM orders were being delayed because of the preoccupation, because of the overburden, because of the pendency. And the banks were in fact not very happy and satisfied with the kind of uh, speed in the uh, invocation of surface action. And the original objective of introducing surface law in India was in fact not being uh, achieved clearly. And the state, on the other hand, the state, on the other hand, contended that the, the, uh, they, they in fact prayed that the appeal filed by the borrower should be dismissed. And looking into the volume of work and the application pending with the DM or CMM, along with other duties like the administrative work and the view of, so they were saying that they are very busy, they have other, uh, other duties. So therefore, this judgment is good. And they were saying that the appeal filed by the borrower should be uh, dismissed. Now, the Supreme Court had finally given a decision. And the Supreme Court decision says that Section 14.1a was inserted. And in fact, that was inserted 
uh, while the exercising powers under section 14 of this VCI, the DM or CMM may authorize any officer subordinate to him to take possession of such assets and documents relating thereto and to forward such documents and assets to the secured creditor. So this amendment was inserted. And after that, the Supreme Court said that the uh, section 14 uh, uh, predicates that if the secured creditor intend to take possession of the secured asset, it must approach, he must approach the CMM DM by way of an application in writing and on receipt of such request, the CMM DM must move into action in the right earnest. Possession of the secured assets can be taken by the secured creditor before confirmation of the sale of the secured assets as well as post confirmation of the sale like this was also a very, in fact, a challenging issue, whether the uh, assets can be sold without taking physical possession or not. So it was also decided in this judgment that the assets can be sold even without taking the physical possession. And it is very clearly held in this case that the possession can be taken by the secured creditor even after the sale of the asset to third parties or any um, party. Then uh, they're saying that the even additional CMM can be said to be at par with the CMM in so far as powers to be exercised under criminal procedure code are concerned. Now the Supreme Court further held in this case that the CMM in addition may have administrative powers. However, for all other purposes and more particularly the powers to be exercised under the criminal procedure code both are at par. Therefore, the additional CMM cannot be said to be subordinate to the CMM in so far as exercise of judicial powers are concerned. CMM or DM has to act within the stipulated time limit and pass a suitable order for the purpose of taking possession of the secured assets within a period of 30 days from the date of application, which can be extended for such further period, but not exceeding an aggregate 60 days. Thus, the powers exercised by the CMM DM is a ministerial act. He cannot brook delay. That means that he cannot just generate a delay out of it. The expression chief metropolitan magistrate as appearing in section 14 of the Surface Act shall mean, shall deem to mean and include additional chief metropolitan magistrate for the purpose of section 14 of the Surface Act. So this was the uh, judgment, Ankit, so you would like to add. So this is basically two things that was decided by this judgment. One, that the additional uh, DM and the additional CMM have equal powers as provided in section 14. They are equally powerful to pass an order and also get the property and the documents regarding the secured asset handed over to the secured creditor. Secondly, uh, the, the second very, very important part which was decided by the Supreme Court is that the secured creditor is uh, authorized to sell the asset uh, even without taking the physical possession and the physical possession can be taken after the sale is effected. So, so I think uh, it's like a remarkable judgment and uh, I think as this judgment spreads and as it is, it, this judgment must be brought to the knowledge of the many DM CMMs. On my recent visit to Kolkata, I realized and everyone was talking about how the DMs uh, are taking a lot of time in giving orders for support uh, and then of course that was a big problem. Uh, that every bank was sharing. So it's a regional issue there and some districts are especially uh, having an issue. So uh, I think a centralized kind of a combined representation wherever a regional uh, a DM or any DM of any district is not cooperating with respect to surface is a must requirement. And then escalating it to the CM's office and so on might help. Uh, yeah, but remarkable judgment. I think a lot of takeaways from it. So one of the few things that I observed was that the, the judgment also talks about prior to possession and post uh, the, uh, the symbolic possession uh, or post-sale or pre-sale, the DM order can be applied. So that's also remarkable because many cases, banks choose to uh, prevent the investment uh, in the security or in the possession, and then they try and find a market and then take possession. So that's also very helpful. 
and also ankit wherever the dm is overburdened i think the banks and or the agents can go to the dm and they can even uh, hand over this judgment and then can say that you can authorize your uh, additional uh, dm or you can authorize your additional cmm and also in the next judgment today we are also discussing a judgment where even the advocate commissioner appointment of advocate commissioners has been held as absolutely valid by honorable supreme court <clears throat> so all the possibilities are open the the if the dm is busy the cmm is busy they can delegate it to their uh, officers even the even the officer if the officers are also busy then they can appoint the advocate commissioners for taking possession and handing over the documents and the possession to the secured creditors so this is something which is completely <clears throat> clearing the hurdles under the surface yet but the only issue is that somebody should take it to the dm offices some somebody should take to cmm office and then uh, this can actually bring results moving on to the next judgment which is indian overseas bank versus rcm infrastructure limited this judgment was uh, given on 18th may 2022 and this is again a kind of uh, a mixture of uh, the surface as well as ibc in this judgment it has been held it has been held that at what stage the sale is considered as concluded and if the sale is not concluded then ibc would over uh, would the override the surface and then the sale cannot be continued if the partial sale has taken place and what is partial and what is final sale under surface <clears throat> this is also a, a a very very useful judgment so in this case the account became npa and then in fact they were uh, the uh, the the appli the the appellant the appellant in this case as you know the it is indian overseas bank the issued a demand notice also they took possession of two secured assets two secured assets the possession was taken one of these properties in fact in the name of the cd and the other in the name of the corporate guarantor the e auction was also conducted and in the meantime <clears throat> while the e auction was being conducted in the meantime the corporate debtor filed a petition under section 10 of the ibc under section 10 of the ibc the in fact the bank hurriedly uh, confirmed the sale out of the e auction process and took 25% of the bidding amount which was 8.23 crore and the earnest money deposit including the earnest money and the sale certificate was also issued by the bank before the commencement of cirp so before the because the bank also apprehended that this insolvency application has been filed and the bank in fact took 25% and hurriedly gave a, a sale certificate and subsequent to the issue of sales certificate subsequent to the issue of sales certificate and clt admitted the section 10 application and section 14 was invoked immediately then uh, the indian overseas bank which is the appellant in this case filed its claim and that claim was restricted to 75% of the amount because the 25% has already been received but the claim was admitted a claim was filed for 75% of the amount as which was not received however due later on after submission of the claim the indian overseas bank in fact accepted the balance 75% which can be about 25 crores of rupees accepted 24.69 crore and then they revised their claim in form c to the irp and the amount of 20 so 4.69 was reduced and the balance was claimed as a for as a claimant from the irp in cirp process now in this case the promoter was aggrieved and promote uh, the promoter uh, therefore filed an application praying nclt to set aside the security realization uh, during cirp period and the therefore nclt allowed the sub application nclt held that this uh, balance amount cannot be recovered during cirp the indian overseas bank filed an appeal before nclat and also got rejected and now the issue before the supreme court is whether the bank can continue the proceedings under surface act once the cirp is initiated and the moratorium is ordered and of course the the intent of the legislation was also very clearly mentioned in section 14 where it was very clearly said including any action under surface act 
that is significant because under section 14, this special word is also added in section 14. And now the uh, section 238 was also argued that the IBC is a complete code in itself. And in view of the presence of section 238, the presence of the code would prevail notwithstanding anything inconsistent therewith contained in any other law for the time being in force. And section 14, 1C was also uh, argued where it is very clearly said that the, uh, uh, that the uh, which have overriding effect over any other law and any action to foreclose, recover, or enforce any security interest created by these corporate debtor in respect of its properties, including any action under the Surface Act is prohibited. Now the, the appellant, in fact, appellant uh, was taking some uh, dependence on uh, two case laws, which was one is Shakina and another versus Bank of India, and other is S. Karthik versus N. Subhash Chandra. And the, in fact, the appellant, the uh, the, the appellant was saying that once the sale certificate is issued, the sale is complete. The section 54 of the Transfer of Property Act was also relied by the, uh, by the appellant, by the uh, borrower or the buyer of the property. That the merely because of the part payment was received subsequent after initiation of CRP, it will not deprive the appellant from receiving the said money in pursuance of the uh, said which has been uh, completed uh, in, in sale which has been completed now this uh, in fact the appellant also said in fact the appellant also said that the in the case of shakina and another versus bank of india it has been it has been held that sales certificate issued in favor of respondent uh, did not require registration and that the sale process was complete on issuance of sales certificate. And the same was also followed in a case called S. Karthik versus Sub N. Subhash Chandran. Hence, the sale was complete upon receipt of part payment and upon issue of the sales certificate. And the, uh, I think we will go to the, uh, the observations from the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court observations in this case was that the, once the CIRP is commenced, a moratorium kicks in as per section 141C of the code, and there is a complete prohibition from any action to foreclose. Any action to foreclose, recover, or enforce any security interest created by the corporate debtor in respect of properties. So that means the foreclosure is prohibited, recovery is prohibited, any action to foreclose. So therefore, receiving the balance money of 75% on a sale, which was in fact done before the commencement of CIRP, is also considered as part of the action to foreclose recovery and enforcement of security interest. The word including any action under the Surface Act are significant. The legislative intent is very clear that after the CIRP is initiated, all actions, including any action under the Surface Act, to foreclose, recover, or enforce any security interest is prohibited. And again, it was section 238 was also referred. And the, finally, it was said by the Honorable Supreme Court that the bank could not have continued the proceedings under the Surface Act once the CIRP was initiated and the moratorium was ordered. The bank cannot continue the proceedings under the Surface Act once the CIRP was initiated and the moratorium was ordered. So this was the final order. That means that the whatever sale was conducted by the bank and the money was received that was quashed. So this is the outcome of this order. Uh, IBC would prevail and the surface uh, would not, uh, the transactions under surface would fail. So in case, in case we have to use this judgment of Indian overseas in those cases where any third party has purchased any property from a corporate debtor and have paid some advance, maybe 50%. And in the meantime, while the sale has not been completed, in the meantime, in case the, uh, in, in case the CIRP starts, then what would be the fate of that buyer who has paid 50%, whether he will have a lien on the property uh, as a like kind of a, a right of specific performance, 
whether that would be considered as a security interest, which is actually mentioned in the definition of security interest, or he would be considered as an operational creditor or a financial creditor. And if if financial creditor, would it be would it be a secured uh, a creditor or unsecured creditor? So all these uh, issues uh, to some extent, uh, but then those are not surface law, that's a, uh, a transfer of property act. Any transaction under the transfer of property act, would that be really considered as uh, stayed or unlawful and how the money of uh, that particular third party will go back? So, so I would I would differentiate and say that if the other party is not in default of the timelines that in within which the payment was required to be made, then saying that that because that person gave an advance and subsequently CRP started penalizing that person or rather giving that money back to him um, uh, and, and cancelling the entire process might be also unfair to that person because the process was completed before the IBC took shape or, or, or the initiated. Uh, but yes, uh, again, can there can be a decision on the contrary that somebody says that no, that sale, if it was not completed, then it was not completed and therefore it needs to be reversed. That can also be the case. In many cases, uh, the money that goes to the seller or the seller bank or the bank who is, uh, who is invoking surfacey, um, paying it back might be an option. Yes, that money is not used anywhere else. It is with the bank. Normally, I think it's perhaps even parked as a deposit uh, and not adjusted as a recovery. Um, so I think this is a disputed issue, whether this uh, third party uh, who has entered into an agreement, a bona fide person, would that actually be uh, survive or not? Would that transaction survive or not? In case the transaction would not survive, whether that person would be an operational creditor or a secured creditor. If it would be an operational creditor or a financial creditor, whether it would be a secured or not, whether the uh, right of specific performance will be considered as a security interest or not, these are all the issues which has to be decided by the uh, court uh, in, in, in one of the cases, wherever. So I can take up, I can just quickly talk about some Q&A that has come in. Um, yes. and, and we have a uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Srinu has uh, uh, said that promoters may deliberately file Section 10 application to prevent surface action. Yes, very much. I think we have seen some cases where this has been done in the past. Uh, then uh, in case of IOB versus RCM Intra, public money is lost since an IBC bank may not be able to recover whole amount in IBC proceedings. Can't say IBC is a superior uh, provision. So yes, uh, whether banks will lose money or not, I think we are all working towards quicker uh, uh, turnaround in the IBC process. Uh, then uh, question then from uh, Naveen Chan is that what if the asset is of the third party guarantor? So the moratorium that comes into IBC comes or comes into place in, during IBC is only on the assets of the corporate debtor or in case of an individual insolvent, uh, individual person or an individual guarantor to the property belonging to that person. So somebody who owns the property who is not in the IBC process, there is no problem. Surfacey can continue there. Um, then uh, any judgments where sale under Surfacey can be cancelled by operation of law? Uh, I don't think so. So I think... Uh, no, there are uh, uh, some cases where the sale under surface has actually been cancelled because of some non-compliances by the by the secured creditor, or uh, um, there are some judgments where the sale has actually been quashed. Has to uh, be a problem with the process or where the where there has been some kind of a major issue there. Hmm. So, so this surface, the Supreme Court and the High Courts have said many times that the surface law is a very harsh law. It's a very very harsh. So therefore, the process which has been uh, prescribed, including the rules, that has to be followed in spirit and in word. Mm -hmm. Nobody can simply say that since the law has now empowered uh, him, the process would not be followed. In case the process is not followed, in case the uh, objections are not replied, in case the uh, letters are not replied, in case the in case any kind of uh, uh, like uh, lacuna, any kind of lapses, uh, we have seen that the many sales actually 
have been quashed uh, in the past. And that is some sense of Resila is getting cleaner and cleaner. It has already been held that nobody can even have a security interest better than under surface law because it is also uh, having a proper shield against the statutory authorities or against the attachment of uh, uh, the property from various uh, uh, departments, authorities, because the section 26 capital E, which was inserted on 1st of September 2016, has given all these powers and security and where even the uh, process would be expedited by DM and the CMM, that was also the amendment in uh, September 2020, uh, 2016, when uh, the one line was added that or any officer subordinate to him and this these are all like the amendments which has come in 2016 and which has helped surface law to be more effective and faster and cleaner any other question so amit ji is amit gupta ji is asking during crp moratorium can suspended directors take back the position of secured assets which is currently in the position of rpe by claiming that secured asset does not belong to cd and only belong to suspended directors so in case there is any property or any asset which is not belonging to the cd uh, belonging to somebody else then the rp should not have any right to take possession of those anyway i think we are discussing a different topic so um, then uh, um, <clears throat> if the bank has taken physical possession of the secured asset before commencement of CRP under Surface Act, uh, whether the bank is required to hand over the possession of such asset to the IRPRP? Yes, if the bank has not sold that asset, then the bank is required to hand it over to the IRPRP. Uh, that's the law. Then, uh, can an FDR held as security be crystallized during CRP? <laughs> so, no, I think FDR being the... The FDR held as a security, yes, it can be realized because mm -hmm. that's an asset in the name of the corporate debtor. And the RP has the authority and powers to take control and custody of all the uh, assets, all the assets under the, uh, under the IBC law. So any FDR which was actually kept as a security margin by the bank, the RP has the right to take control of that FDR and cash that and even use it for CIRP expenditure. And that is the uh, law. But then uh, the, the banks are in fact, uh, not really cooperating in that manner. But yes, in case somebody fights a case, uh, uh, because see, this is a kind of uh, a secured asset. So the secured asset or unencumbered asset, encumbered asset or unencumbered assets, both are supposed to be taken over by the RP. It is not only the unencumbered asset. So even if the FDR is encumbered or the properties which are mortgaged are also called encumbered. So the RP is still taking the possession of all the properties, even the cars which are financed by the companies. That also has to be uh, uh, taken and taken over by the RP. So therefore, even the FDR has got no change, no difference like as against a car if yeah, but car we have we have seen cases where there have been attempts by the banks to try and encash the fdr because they feel that no there is no evidence that the fdr exists so they can adjust it and then rather sometimes we feel that the money that is uh coming in from the uh, realization of the fdr is directly credited by the banks to their recovery account without rooting it through the cd's name so all that happens. So one thing that we do uh, uh, practically is that we check the 26 AS of the CD. And in case there is any interest income that is coming in, maybe in the quarter right next to the CRP date, then we can approach the bank and say that there's this FD which was lying in the name of the CD just before the CRP date. So we need the whereabouts of this FDR. So that helps normally. If there are other questions, or we'll take this question later now. Okay, well, let's take, let's go forward. So the next segment is so, uh, RCEL means Asset Reconstruction Company India Limited versus SP uh, uh, Vilatham, and it's a Supreme Court judgment in delivered in uh, May fourth, May twenty twenty two by uh, Mr. Justice Hemant Kumar, Hemant Gupta, and Mr. Justice V Subramanian. 
And this was a case, older case of 1992, where the Indian bank sanctioned loan and the mortgage property default and the sale notice uh, the, was issued by this, uh, a sale notice was issued based on the assignment. And then this was assigned to uh, our sale. Now this, this is a case of a fraud. In fact, the original owners registered a power of attorney, original owners of the property, they registered a power of attorney in, in, the, in the first respondent's name that forbade the agent from encumbering any real estate. Now the agent was granted the power of sale by executing a second deed of power, but it was not recorded. Now the, what the borrower has done, first power of attorney was executed and it was mentioned in that power of attorney that the, uh, the agent has got no power for encumbering, um, encumbering this property. Second uh, power of uh, attorney was also issued and in that it was also the power of sale was also granted. And in fact, the borrower, I think the, the borrower sold the property to his son as per the power of attorney. And then when the uh, bank in fact tried, so for, therefore the immediately the writ petition was filed before the high court. So this is an entire dispute First High Court said that this particular suit should, it says it should be a civil suit and it should not be a writ petition. So that was the problem. So therefore this went to, to the Supreme Court and the primary issue which was handled by the Supreme Court, whether when there is a jurisdiction of a civil court, whether the High Court can actually have the powers or not, that is under section 145 of the Code of Criminal Procedure and, and whether it has to be moved to civil court. In fact, High Court could understand, and the the on the Supreme Court could understand that the uh, the the petition which before the High Court was to uh, declare that document as null and void, the document where the borrower transferred the property to his son based on a separate power of attorney which was not disclosed to bank. The first power of attorney, which was disclosed to bank, based on the first power of attorney, the property was mortgaged to bank. The second proper power of attorney was not disclosed to the bank and the property was transferred to son. And it was doubt, it was, it, it was kind of uh, argued that the property is not, more, the, the mortgage was not valid. However, the transfer of the property to son is valid. However, the bank went to the High Court and in the writ petition, uh, the High Court in fact uh, decided, pronounced that it was null and void. And however, the, the, although the Supreme Court said that the authority lies with the civil courts, but this does not preclude the High Court from considering whether or not the registering authority fulfilled its legal obligations. The Supreme Court also held that a declaration that a document is null and void is exclusively within the domain of the civil court. There is no dispute, but it does not mean that the High Court cannot examine the question whether or not the registering authority performed his uh, uh, statutory duties in the manner prescribed in the law. So this is primarily a case of a fraud which was in fact handled, although the borrower wanted to uh, argue that the, it is not the jurisdiction of High Court. This should have gone to a civil court. The High the Supreme Court said, yes, we agree that this is the jurisdiction of a civil court, but it is also not a kind of, uh, no, nothing res, uh, restrict a High Court to take a decision uh, on this kind of, uh, like it's a kind of a fraud. That's what is the objective of it. Right. Yeah, I think that's pretty clear. Yeah. Yeah. Going forward, NKGSB is a cooperative bank. Subir Chakravarti uh, is the respondent, and it is February 22, 25th of February 22 is the uh, order. So, this is the basic issue is the, uh, the matter before the Supreme Court was the ambiguities and conflicting views over the appointment of advocates as commissioners appointment of advocates as commissioner is being done by CMM uh, or DM, where they appoint an advocate commissioner and the scope of the advocate commissioner is to uh, go to the police based on the order, the police uh, uh, seek police support 
and then go to the property secured asset, take the possession and hand it over to the secured creditor. That's the duty, that's the scope. And most of the states, most of the CMMs are in fact working in this manner that in the very first or second hearing, they can they will appoint advocate commissioner. And there is a panel of advocates who are uh, empaneled with the courts and they can be appointed from the panel. And that's what is being happened. And it's like uh, very effective. In fact, very effective. It is actually reduced the time for getting a CMM or DMM order substantially. And in Delhi-like state, we are getting this, these orders within the stipulated 30 days. Now, in fact, the, why this issue came, because this uh, uh, Bombay High Court on one side and the Kerala High Court, Madras High Court and Delhi High Court is on the other side. There are different views. So the issue which was involved, whether it is open to DM or the CMM to appoint an advocate and authorize him or her to take possession of the secured assets and documents relating thereto and forward the same to the secured creditor within the meaning of Section 14, 1, capital A of the surface here. This was the issue which was involved before the Honorable uh, Supreme Court. So the section 14.1a of the Surface Act was also read where this amendment had taken place where it said may authorize any officer subordinate to him. The district magistrate or chief magistrate may, chief metropolitan magistrate may authorize any officer subordinate to him to take possession of such assets and documents relating thereto and to forward such assets and documents to the secured creditor. So this was the kind of uh, uh, section 14.1a, where the uh, uh, High Court of Bombay has held in 2019 in the case of Subir Chakravarti versus the uh, uh, Kotak Mahindra Bank Limited. And it is saying that <clears throat> it is strictly for the DM and the CMM, it cannot authorize an advocate. That was the uh, view of uh, Bombay High Court. Whereas in the Kerala High Court, it was contrary view. And they are saying the power lies with the magistrate to uh, uh, take the aid of the police, including an advocate commissioner. Similarly, the High Court of Madras also in the case of Chandra Mohan and, uh, and another's versus Chief Metro Metropolitan uh, uh, Magistrate Agmore Chinnai, and we're also I was saying that nothing prohibits the CMM from authorizing an advocate commissioner. So the High Court of De Delhi also, in fact, in the case of Rahul Chaudhary versus Andhra Bank said, in the, in the year 2020, that the dealing with the similar issues interpreted that this expression may related to choice of the subordinate officer that can be appointed by the CM DMM. And CM DMM is vested with the discretion to appoint officers uh, subordinate to him to take possession. Hence, they have the discretion to appoint subordinate officers. So, the of subordinate officers, there is no bar to appoint uh, advocates uh, for doing this job. So, the Supreme Court further also said that provided for the appointment of court commissioner in order to carry out a, a myriad of ministerial and administrative duties, thereby making it a customary concept. Uh, the decision was that it is immediately move into action. It is the duty of the CMM DM to immediately move into the action whenever an application under section 14 subsection one is received. Uh, and it is also uh, the, it is a common knowledge that the respective jurisdictions, there is only one CM, CMM DM, and uh, he's expected to reach out at every location himself for taking possession. It is not, it is absurd. And in some jurisdiction, it would be impracticable, if not impossible for him to do so, owing to large number of applications. And it also may be like distances between the office of the DMCM and the property. Uh, location and therefore they are saying that it uh, is secured. At, see, like any officer subordinate to him, that would not mean a point appointing a PN or clerk, uh, but that can of course uh, that can be a commission uh, the advocate because finally the advocate has been held as the advocate is a guardian of constitutional morality and justice equally with the judge. Uh, so an advocate is an officer of the court and thus subordinate to the CMM DM. Hence, it would be open to the CMM DM to appoint an advocate commissioner to assist him in execution of orders under section 14.1 of the 
surface era. So this is also a good uh, uh, judgment, Ankit. Yep. Going forward, we have this Bank of Broda versus Carva Trading Company. Judgment is dated 10th of February 2022 from Honorable Supreme Court. And in this case, and in this case, uh, the uh, the loan was taken, and there are the two mortgaged properties. One is industrial plot, and the other is a residential property. And the payment was not coming, so the account became NPA. So the symbolic possession was taken. Symbolic possession was taken, and the another notice, the uh, the possession also was taken. See, after the possession was taken, after the possession was taken, and the bank issued a sale notice for public auction of the residential property for forty eight point six five lakhs, in accordance with Rule Eight, read with Rule Nine of the Security Interest Rules. Now the a public auction at 48.65 lakhs. Now this sale was challenged by the uh, respondent, means the owner of the property. Uh, it was challenged before the DRT. DRT in, it, in DRT in fact passed an interim order, directed the appellant to pay 20 lakhs on the day of the auction to prevent the bank from confirming the sale and the balance to be paid within a week's time from the date of auction. Upon Payment, the bank was to deliver the possession of the property to the respondent, and the order was duly followed, and the respondent duly deposited a sum of rupees 48.65 lakhs within the bank. Now, look at this scenario, Ankit. The uh, property is now being auctioned at a reserve price of 48.65. The owner of the property or the borrower went to TRT. DRT says that you deposit 20 lakhs rupees on the day of auction and the balance within seven days. In fact, the borrower, in fact, the borrower deposited the entire 48.65 lakhs within, with, with the appellate bank. However, in the meantime, what happened that the property was auctioned by the bank and the highest bid was 75, 71 lakhs. Now, the bank, in fact, saw that the reserve price is 48.65 lakhs the borrower or the owner of the property is offering the same amount. The auction, which is 71 lakhs, the auction has already been concluded at 71 lakhs. Although the, even earlier, uh, he was ready to pay 48.65. The So this was the uh, scenario that the, even DRAT also uh, dismissed uh, the appeal. Uh, now, uh, the, uh, the division bank of the, uh, Division Bank of the High Court uh, said that uh, instead of uh, 71, you deposit 65.65 and then the property would be yours. So in this case, the appeal was then filed before the uh, Honorable Supreme Court and the issue which was framed whether the Division Bank was justified in its order directing the appellant to hand over the possession and the title deed of the property to the respondent upon payment of 65.65 lakhs against its total dues of 185. Total dues 185, amount ordered by the court 65.65, reserve price 48, and the auction has already been concluded, concluded at 71. So these are the difficulties. And finally, not very important, why should we spend uh, the entire time on this? So the finally the court said, finally the court said the, I say first of all, the 65.65, decision of 65.65 is not really uh, based on any logic. When the auction was 75, one lakh, 71, one lakh, the reserve price was 48, uh, over outstanding is 185. So why 65.65? The calculation that could not be understood. And then the appeal was still pending. Uh, but then the court finally held that even if, even if it would be, it would have been taken over by the promoter or the owner of the property at 71 uh, lakhs, that would not, that did not imply to secure creditors whole dues that did not employ discharge of the secured creditors whole dues, including all cost charges and expenditures borne. And the, finally, they said that the banks will have power to proceed against the borrower for the balance amount, 
if the property is purchased by the same person who is the borrower also, that doesn't mean that the balance amount would be waived. So allowing the appeal, the Honorable Court had that the bank could not be restrained from selling the mortgage property by holding a public auction to recover the outstanding dues unless the respondent deposited the entire amount of dues payable along with the cost. So he paid the ent a part of the amount, he paid 20 lakhs of rupees, but then the, high, the Supreme Court say that it should be entire amount. Without the entire amount payment, the, nobody can stop. Nobody can stop the auction process. Yes, and keep working. So basically, the judgment will help in any scenario where the borrower is making a demand that because I have made part payment, you stop the process. So I think this judgment can always be used to and kind of interpret it to say that even if the borrower has made some advance and he's not able to pay the balance within the prescribed time allowed by the bank, then the bank can still go ahead continue the auction process. Yes, I think this. Uh... And also, like for a borrower to say that, okay, I'm paying 46.65, that is the reserve price, and the bank getting 71 in the market, there is no reason that the bank should stop and not, uh, you know, get 71 from the market. Yes, 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 you're absolutely right. To come in and say that, no, bank should allow 10% less to be accepted, that's also doesn't seem to be fair. So the next segment. Phoenix ARC Private Limited versus Vishwa Bharti Vidya Mandir. It is again a judgment dated January 2022 from Justice M. R. Shah and Justice Sanjeev Khanna. So in this case, the Vishwa Bharti Vidya Mandir was the borrower and running an educational institution. Loans were taken and another society also had availed some credit facilities and the properties, personal guarantee, as well as the equitable mortgage by of title deeds of the properties were issued in favor of the bank. And the account became NPA under section 32 sub, uh, notice was given. And the account was finally assigned to Phoenix ARC by the bank. And that was in 2014. And the assign, after the assignment, in fact, there was one restructuring and repayment of the outstanding dues also, but then However, the borrowers failed to honor the restructuring plan. And finally, the, uh, the Phoenix ARC took possession of the mortgage property. And now the uh, issued the uh, mortgage property, took possession of the mortgage property after expiring of 50 days. Now, in this case, the issue was that this Phoenix ARC has only issued a letter, has only issued a letter uh, a, a letter is a possession notice under section 13.4 of the surface area, which is against the security interest enforcement rules or not. The, uh, the, the Phoenix ARC uh, the, take the possession of the mortgage property after expiry of 15 days was challenged by the respondent before the High Court. The respondent means the borrower said that this particular property has not been acquired under the security interest enforcement rules. Uh, so Honorable High Court therefore passed an ex parte interim uh, order directing status quo to be maintained with regard to the possession of the properties and subject to the borrower making a payment of one crore with the appellant. So it was opposed, it was opposed by the uh, Phoenix and because of the High Court giving a stay, it was opposed by the Phoenix and Phoenix said, and the ARC said that it was only a letter. It was a proposed letter only. It was not a proper surface action. And based on the proposed letter, the High Court should not have given any kind of stay. <clears throat> so the Supreme Court, in fact, in fact, the Supreme Court held and passed a kind of too many strictures in this case, on the high courts, uh, the in the high court, in fact, it was said, uh, the Supreme Court observed that the secured creditor or its assigner have a right to recover the amount due and payable to it from the borrowers. And the stay granted by the high court would have serious adverse impact on the financial health of the secured creditor. Then further, the High Court said that the relying on the judgment of authorized officer State Bank of Travancore and another versus Matthew Casey, the Honorable Court opined that the filing of the writ petition by the borrower 
filing of the writ petition by the borrowers before the High Court under Article 226 of the Constitution of India is an abuse of the process of the court. The writ petitions have been filed against the proposed action to be taken under Section 134. Hence, the High Court should have extremely careful and uh, circumspect in exercising its discretion while granting stay in such manners the apex court while allowing the appeal and dismantling the proceeding before the High Court. So this is where you have to say, Ankit, uh, the, uh, it was only a letter. It was not a full process of taking possession. There was no DMM order. There was no CMM order. The, the only the Phoenix simply issued a letter based on the letter itself. Based on the letter itself, the uh, uh, the High Court, in fact, stayed the process on a payment of one crore, and therefore the Honorable Supreme Court said, said that uh, it's an abuse. British borrowers going to High Courts under under Article Two Twenty Six is an abuse of the process of the court. So that was a, the, in fact held by this case uh, in the Supreme Court. We can take some of the questions, Ankit, and. So important. Yeah, so I think I will just go through the questions. Um is saying the guarantors are using personal insolvency to restrict lenders from sale of assets under surface due to applicability of interim moratorium. I think it's already taken care of or being proposed to be taken care of in the amendment in the IBC. So I think everyone realizes that this is happening and they are amending this, this law or the, the provisions in the law which are allowing this. Uh, while on the subject, would like to know about the status of statutory liabilities. Will it pass on to the auction purchaser? So, statutory liabilities with respect to GST and other liabilities do not pass on to the auction purchaser, but then there might be certain liabilities which are attached to the or which are linked to the land in the building, which might pass on to the buyer in case of a surface purchase. These are possible to be waived in an IBC procedure. But in surface, sometimes the uh, liabilities attached to the land or the building itself by the land revenue authorities, by the land uh, uh, agencies or the industrial bodies, they can stick. Uh, Hemanji is asking MOU for purchase of land, which is stock and trade to CD. CD took 10% advances subject to permissions from local authorities. The transaction was to go ahead. However, CD went to IBC. As per MOU, if the transaction is not going ahead, the advances given to 70 lakhs, given to up to 70 lakhs will be carried into a percent So claim here will be uh, that of an OC, if I'm not wrong. I don't think this will become an FC. Uh, no, I think, uh, Ankit, there is a dispute. As I said, that there is a dispute in case we see the definition of financial debt under Section 5, Subsection 8, and Clause F. Mm. It is very clearly said that any advance given for any forward purchase or sale would be considered as the financial debt. Mm. However, somehow, <clears throat> somehow the uh, the NCLT, NCLAT has given few judgments where all these amount which has been paid by third parties to the corporate debtor for anything called operations uh, would be called an operational creditor as per the judgment because my i still have a very very uh, strong faith that any money which is being paid to the corporate debtor by way of a check that means a financial debt mm. and that is actually provided in section 5 subsection 8 and clause f any amount paid for any forward purchase and sale would be a financial debt and in case uh, any specific performance thing for security interest definition very, very specifically provide a specific performance. And then the taken to the uh, buyer whose transaction could not be completed because of the CIRP initiation, he would become a secured financial creditor. That's what is my belief. And then thereafter, he can even, uh, he, he can, uh, he can say that I don't want to uh, relinquish my rights in favor of the liquidation estate. So good. So I think we are past our time. There are, I've also taken most questions. In case there are any remaining questions, we can always take them offline. I think this is a judgment from High Court of Karnataka, where it is a very simple question has been answered that if a bank, if a bank is entering, bank enters into a one-time settlement, 
mm-hmm. and all the conditions of one time settlement is 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 complied by the borrower and then at the peak of it at the apex of it the bank has no power to cancel the ots so this particular judgment which is in front rima transfers and conductors private limited versus canara bank in this particular judgment the high court of karnataka has held this i think we can uh, uh, we have finished our uh, uh, agenda today this happens uh, many times so yeah in a recent case where a borrower was willing to pay a psu bank the full money but was asking for more time and also made some payment the bank never went for an ots but the bank uh, was uh, then willing to not even give a letter to say that yes we are giving this more time on your commitment so it was an kind of an internal communication that they finally shared so yes that is possible that some documentation is generated by the borrower or kept with him to safeguard himself in case there is such a settlement with the bank otherwise what might happen is that the ba- borrower might have paid a lot of money and the bank still might go for surface yes yes so uh, ankit it was a good uh, two session a two part uh, deliberations on the supreme court judgments on surface some of the judgments were also having kind of uh, uh parallel issues of ibc and um, some of the judgments also basically is defined that the msc msme act doesn't override uh, surface so all these things in fact adds to a lot of clarity i would st- i would still reiterate that the surface is a better law it's a cleaner law it's an effective law it's a faster law however for any company which is a running company the insolvency would be better where the operations are supposed to be run so this is what we can conclude and uh, thank you everyone for participating and we will continue our efforts like the same as we are doing it thank you everyone all right thank you thank you